The governor delivers his state of the state today and pushes back on the alternative facts being offered by the White House. Also, connecting the homeless to supplies and resources. The annual San Diego event is still taking volunteers and donations. Banana! Banana! And San Diego scientists create a swarm of ocean minions, why they're vital for understanding life on Earth. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. Today, a state of the state address that pulls no punches for the new president. Governor Jerry Brown strongly defended California's liberal policies and laws on health care, climate change and immigration, saying the state may be called on to defend those laws. Brown also touched on President Trump's promise to improve infrastructure in the country and to build and build big. Before his address, Brown, Brown swore in his new state attorney general, Javier Becerra. It was one more round of wet, stormy weather today with rain, hail, and snow. On Monday, the governor declared a state of emergency for the county due to the tens of millions of dollars in damages caused by the powerful storms. They've been drenching the region since last week, but we should see an end to the rain by tomorrow. And we'll have your full forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Plans to store the San Onofre spent energy fuel is running behind schedule. They're being stored in canisters 100 feet from the ocean. KPBS reporter Allison St. John says the new Republican administration in Washington, D.C. won't change the debate over where to store the nuclear waste in time to move where it's going to go. The operator of San Onofre, Southern California Edison, will start moving all the radioactive spent fuel rods at San Onofre from cooling ponds to dry cask storage next year. The waste will join tons of other spent nuclear fuel in dry cask storage right next to the plant with a wall less than 30 feet high between it and the beach. President Obama stopped plans for a permanent storage site at Nevada's Yucca Mountain in 2010 and Congress has been unable to decide on an alternative site. San Diego Congressman Darrell Issa has sponsored legislation to allow interim consolidated nuclear storage at sites in places like Texas and New Mexico. David Victor of Edison's Citizens Engagement Panel says with Republicans now in a strong majority in Washington, D.C., Yucca Mountain may move back to the front burner. It does appear that any kind of new legislation that's going to open consolidated interim storage facilities is also going to require a restart of the Yucca Mountain facility. And I think that's what's shaping up on Capitol Hill right now. However, either interim or permanent storage sites will take years to approve, even if legislation passes. In the meantime, Edison has hired a contractor to build vertical canisters for the waste and is firming up security measures. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission will monitor the process of moving the spent fuel from the cooling ponds and into the casks starting next year. Allison St. John, KBBS News. 
Donations are piling up and more are needed for the 11th annual Project Homeless Connect. Today, the San Diego Housing Commission accepted supplies at Golden Hall downtown. They're taking blankets, reading glasses, closed toe shoes, warm clothes, and after recent storms, ponchos are in demand. Tomorrow, homeless men, women, and children will receive these supplies. Plus, volunteers will connect them to services like haircuts, health exams, and flu shots. Organizers say it's not too late to sign up to volunteer. Well, I'm always getting asked how can I give back and this is a really easy straightforward way to come and show that you, are, you care about the issue um, and you can help people maneuver their way through the event and access services that they need in order to uh, exit homelessness. And more than 90 service providers are set to take part in the one day resource fair. It's going on from nine in the morning until three in the afternoon. Today, the San Diego City Council adopted a plan to better grow and maintain its urban forests. It's one strategy in the city's climate action plan to reduce greenhouse gases. But KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says the program faces some hurdles. The urban forestry five-year plan doesn't have any new funding or binding policies. It's more a consolidation of existing policies on tree planting and maintenance. Tree planting is something of a science. Planting the wrong species or planting in the wrong location can cause problems later on. Councilman Scott Sherman says it's important the city follow best practices. And I think this really takes us a, a step in the right direction that we're actually going to have a plan. We know what we're going to put in the ground. We know how it works. We're going to be thinking down the road to actually, in the long run, this will save us money because we don't have to go repair streets and dig up roots and dig up trees and what shouldn't have been there in the first place. City staff say the urban forestry program needs more money to achieve its goals. The program also lacks a manager. The previous manager left San Diego this month for a job at another city. Council members said that concerns them given the city's well-documented problems with recruiting and retaining qualified staff. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. San Ysidro residents may soon have a better idea of how vehicles are impacting the quality of their air. In the second part of our series, KPBS reporter Eric Anderson looks at how community activists and researchers are teaming up to measure air pollution. In a sense, this intersection encapsulates the area's problems. Houses just a few hundred yards that way. The international border just a few hundred yards that way. And as a result, we get a lot of traffic in this area traffic that represents pollution. David Flores opens the door to an old wood frame stucco church. The building sits in the heart of an older residential neighborhood in San Isidro. Flores climbs up a staircase and then up a shaky ladder. He can see Mexico from the roof, but that's not why he's here. He's looking at a gray metal box that's big enough to hold a pair of work boots. It's perched on a metal tripod. So this is the box, right? Uh -huh. This is the, uh, the equipment that the University of Washington has developed. Okay. Um, really compact and in a weatherproof cover. You can hear the, the fan, right? Sucking up the air. The air that's drawn inside is exposed to several sensitive monitors. This dilos is the one that measures, um, that, that's taking all the, all the data and measurements for all the different pollutants. And then here, each one of these represents a different pollutant, nitrous oxide, carbon monoxide, uh, ozone, and uh, nitrogen di dioxide. The monitors take readings and send the data wirelessly to a computer that can analyze and interpret the findings. San Diego State University public health researcher Jenny Quintana is working with University of Washington researchers to make sure the air pollution data is accurate and meets rigorous academic standards. So actual numbers are very useful. In addition, we can find potential sources of air pollution. People have speculated that the border crossing is a source. They've speculated that burning activities and emissions in Tijuana and vehicle emissions in Tijuana can affect communities north of the border, but there's no actual studies and data that can be provided for that, for this community. Scientifically verifiable information can be used to confirm that the region has an air pollution problem. There was a study that used high-end monitors back in 2008, 
but those results were inconclusive. If this effort turns up hard data on pollution, that could help San Isidro push for state and federal money to build parks, bikeways, add air filtration systems to schools and senior centers, and build affordable housing. Quintana says that's why she and other researchers are working with the San Diego Air Pollution Control District. The office's Bob Card says the community monitors are being tested right beside the district's significantly more expensive and sensitive equipment. Because the technology is up and coming, um, not well developed yet, not well vetted, but this is all part of that vetting process where they can determine whether these things are truly giving a picture, a true picture of air quality at what I call the micro scale level, at street level, near sources of traffic or maybe local industries, things like that. Researcher Jenny Quintana says getting it right is crucial. If the monitors are effective, they'll be able to help researchers determine what's in the air and even where it may be coming from. Those are two important steps toward solutions. So I think data accuracy to the extent possible is a really important focus of this study and will help inform other communities as they try to carry out these kind of activities. The possibility that this technology could play a similar role in other neighborhoods is pushing Quintana and David Flores to make sure this study is done right. The research team will monitor the air through the summer. They hope to develop an easy to understand web page that will offer real time pollution data in a practical format that residents can use. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. San Diego scientists have built a swarm of robot minions to study complicated dynamics in the ocean. KPBS science reporter David Wagner has a story. On a recent stormy day, choppy waves crash into the Scripps Pier. This is probably what most people picture when they think of waves, but surface waves are not the only kind. Scripps Institution of Oceanography researcher Peter Franks is interested in waves beneath the surface, internal waves. These are gigantic waves. I mean, if you could surf them, you'd surf for days very, very, very slowly. Franks studies how phytoplankton interact with internal waves. Phytoplankton are the tiny, single-celled organisms that form the crucial base of the ocean's food chain. Internal waves can play a role in accumulations of plankton, such as red tides, which can sometimes be toxic. But Frank says piecing together exactly how this happens isn't easy. But understanding these dynamics, they all come down to physics and chemistry and biological interactions, and that's really hard to understand in the oceans. Sticking one scientific instrument underwater wouldn't provide a full picture of these ever-changing three-dimensional forces. Franks discussed this problem with another Scripps researcher, Jules Jaffe. My laboratory is basically dedicated to building innovative, new, exciting instruments that allow us to discover things about the ocean. Jaffe and Franks knew that what they needed was robotic plankton. Not just one robot, but many of them. In a new study out this week, they and their colleagues described the system of underwater automatons they built to tackle this problem. These are actually scientific instruments that we can deploy in swarms. This swarm of robots is capable of working underwater for hours, collecting data for a dynamic view of complicated ocean interactions. And what we can do is watch the whole group, and therefore we get information about the three-dimensional structure of the ocean so that we're not sampling just a point. We're sampling all those points, and the coherent sort of movements of those is giving us unique information that people have never had before. The robots are each about the size and shape of a coffee can. They're colored bright yellow to make them easy to spot in the water. Franks thinks these squat yellow cylinders kind of look like the minions from the animated Despicable Me movies. <laughs> All they need are some overalls and some glasses and a big smile and they'd be perfect. If we could make the little hydrophone on them go be doo be doo or something like that, it would, it would be great. Banana! Banana! In all seriousness, Frank says these robots are really helping to advance his research. A five-hour test off the coast of Torrey Pines provided real-world confirmation of his theories about internal waves and the formation of plankton patches. For that test, Scripps researchers drove a boat out to sea and dropped 16 robots into the water, letting them dive to a pre-programmed depth. A larger piece of equipment floated on the ocean's surface and sent pings down to the robots below. Once the robots were retrieved, those signals were used to plot the movements of each robot. 
Studying internal waves and plankton accumulation might sound pretty technical, but Frank says it's vital for understanding bigger facts about life on Earth. Every second breath you take is courtesy of the phytoplankton. The oxygen that you are breathing is coming from the phytoplankton out there. And a third of that oxygen is made by phytoplankton that we didn't even know existed 30 years ago. Underwater robots are not new, but Jules Jaffe says this swarm system does open up new possibilities by bringing together so many small robots to continuously and simultaneously record data underwater. He says these robots might prove to be useful for listening to blue whales or tracking underwater oil spills. Oh, one of the things that was really um, scary about the uh, Deepwater Horizon disaster was whether that oil was drifting to the coast of Florida. Maybe these robots could have helped predict the movement of that oil. However researchers end up using them, Jaffe is excited to see what happens when these swarms multiply. David Wagner, KPBS News. Cloudy skies tonight in San Diego, but sunshine for the rest of the week, finally. Shanae Shocker has tonight's forecast. Well, the good news for our Tuesday, it seems it's the last round of the rain. Well, I guess it's good news for us as far as travel and things like that, but bad news as far as the drought goes, so we did get quite a big break from that. Taking a look at our satellite and radar over the past six hours, you can see that we saw those lower clouds, the uh, last storm bringing its last bout of rainfall on shore, and that also really was held off to uh, San Diego County, especially the southern areas of that. We even got some wintry mixture out in towards the mountains near Mount Laguna for today. Into tonight, however, we're going to start to see offshore flow. Patchy clouds roll in 46 degrees for our low tonight in the metro area. Now climbing our way back out into the mountains, temperatures are going to drop quite a bit. 22 degrees into Mount Laguna, Borrego Springs at 36. But we climb our way up the coast. We're cooling off, but not too much. 38 degrees in Oceanside and 41 degrees for Long Beach. Into our Wednesday, this big ridge of high pressure, that's going to be the story over the next few days, actually. That's bringing in offshore flow, so we're going to start to see things really begin to clear out, especially ac across the coastal regions, and this begins for our Wednesday. Taking a look at the coast, our temperatures are going to warm up as we head into Friday and Saturday. Friday and Saturday, seeing the largest offshore breeze, so that's why we really begin to see these temperatures jump back up into the upper 60s. Overall, this week, very comp, lots of sunshine, good beach weather to head out, really enjoy, grab your sweater. And inland, this is where we start to see frost advisories for tonight into tomorrow morning as well, especially into the valley areas around the foothills. We are looking at mostly sunny skies throughout the rest of this weekend into this weekend. Check out those temperatures climbing their way back up into the 70s. We're well below normal as we head into the middle of this week, about 10 to 15 degrees actually. But then as we head towards Sunday, we're we're around five degrees above normal for this time of year. So it is certainly uh, a story of two different uh, temperatures here. Into the mountains we go. Well, uh, we kind of have a back and forth yo-yo effect going on here for our Wednesday, 37 degrees, climbing into the 40s for our Thursday, into our Friday, 38 degrees. Saturday, that's where we get those very windy conditions with those uh, offshore breezes, 47 degrees for our high, 55 for our Sunday. Last but not least, least into the deserts we go, climbing back into the 70s, but before we get there, we're going to sit in the lower 60s through Friday with some windier conditions working their way in into our Friday. And then on our Saturday, plenty of sunshine around the area, and that's going to stick with us through Sunday, and we are seeing temperatures return into the 70s. For KPBS News, I'm Shanae Shocker. Check out these thrill seekers on the slopes. It turns out the adrenaline rush is actually dictated by physics. In tonight's SciTech report, producer Bill Hallman shows us how a Pennsylvania shop is using science to pioneer a new kind of snowboard. On the powder or in the park, snowboarding is pure physics. A mashup of energy and momentum that keeps thrill seekers gravitating toward the mountain every winter. But does adding more science equate with more fun? We travel to Winfield, Pennsylvania to find out. Welcome to the Snowboard Farm. 
home of Gilson Snowboards. Nick Gilson is the CEO and president. The mission of Gilson is to create the most fun snowboards in the world. By adapting the geometry of the shape of the bottom of the board, we can actually build boards that are more fun to ride. And that's really what keeps us going every day. His partner, Austin Royer, is in charge of operations. They both started as science teachers. Their first design was a classroom project. We brought in an idea that I had had when I was uh, their age in middle school, which was basically, you know, why are boats curved when they're moving through water and snowboards are flat when they're moving through snow, which is solid water. Made two snowboards, took them out to the mountain, tested them out, and they were terrible. It was probably the worst snowboards you've, I've ever rode. They were really stiff, they were really, you know, really heavy. Pretty much like riding a canoe down the mountain. Trial and error led to this, a collection of boards Gilson calls the most advanced in the world. Their claim to fame, the soft edge. So the soft edge is a smooth bend in the base material that allows you to do a, a very new maneuver on snow. It allows you to drift. So very much like a surfboard, it can move laterally through the water. A snowboard historically is always sort of up on one edge or up on the other, carving one way or the other. The 3D design keeps the edges off the snow until you need them. For experts, it means new tricks. For beginners, a new learning curve. So, you know, beginner, you're not gonna catch as many edges, so you're gonna have somebody that is just starting off from snowboarding, being able to have more fun faster. Performance is the big payoff, but the science really starts in the shop. The core takes shape here, 100% Pennsylvania poplar, routered to exact specifications. Gilson has four different models. This machine can make them all. The graphics are applied using sublimation. A printer converts solid ink directly to a gas that permeates the plastic. The base is assembled by hand. It takes about 100 clamps per board and industrial super glue to attach the steel edge. So this is what it looks like at the end. You know, you got your plastic here and there you can see the metal edge has been applied the whole way around. Now it's time for assembly, and Gilson starts at the molecular level. The more oxygen that we have on the outside of our, pl our plastic, the better bond it would have to our fiberglass. So if you apply lots of energy to those sideballs, an oxygen bonds to the outside, and then allows it to bond to the fiberglass. After flame treatment, the layer by layer assembly begins. A mix of epoxy and hardener is applied to a sandwich of plastic, fiberglass, and wood. Then it's off to the press. Our presses allow us to press with uniform pressure, and that allows us to get really good clarity on our boards. We also use a hot water system, which recycles the hot water, so we're energy conscious as well. So the first board that we press also helps us press our third and fourth and fifth board. After 40 minutes, it's time for the finish. The 3D design has another advantage, and you can only see it on the finished product, and that's the flex. Just like the corrugations in cardboard or the ridges in a tin roof, that fiberglass, that structural component, is going to be curved. And so when you have a curved shape, it's stronger, and when you bend a curved shape, it comes back harder. And so with our snowboards, when you bend them, you actually have more potential energy. And when they snap back, that potential energy turns into more kinetic energy, sending the rider up higher and really just giving them a board that feels like it's more alive, more responsive. The Gilson team is proud of the science, but really, it's always been about the ride. Probably the, the best experience that I have is when I'm actually out on demo and I'm, I'm letting people ride them and they're telling me how much they like it and I see their name on the, on the production list the next day. You know, watching someone accelerate literally become a better snowboarder in a pretty quick period of time and do things that they didn't think were possible and seeing their reaction, hearing their reaction is just, it's like beyond inspiring. It's like 20 cups of coffee. It just makes me want to get back to work. <laughs> You can see more stories like that one on Aside Tech Now, a Sunday evenings at 5.30, right here on KPBS.
some point, you gotta decide for yourself who you're gonna be. Can't let nobody make that decision for you. Powerful words from Barry Jenkins in Moonlight. The film shines among today's Oscar nominees. It earned eight nominations. A dark cloud hung over the glitz and glamour of the awards last year. That's after the Oscars' so white controversy. Now there's evidence of more diversity among nominees. Out of the 20 nominated actors, seven are people of color. The Academy Awards ceremony is scheduled for February 26th. Now, here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. On Morning Edition, how one city saved $11 billion by pushing for renewable energy sources. And on Midday Edition, we dive into the lives of people with Alzheimer's disease and find out if we're close to finding a cure. That's tomorrow at noon on KPBS Radio. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.